Yesterday, KTAR told you the story of an overdose inside one Arizona prison. Today, we continue our coverage of this story with a sit down interview with Governor Katie Hobbs, where she tells me about her concerns and the future of the Arizona Department of Corrections, Rehabilitation and Reentry. I just want to start off with, you know, up until recently, prisons didn't seem as high of a priority for you, um, but then we saw two executive orders come through. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of uh, explain to me your thought process there? Sure. I mean, I think um, we've all seen the reporting for years now on um, lack of transparency, so many issues in our prison system. Um, so it's certainly been something that's that's been a focus, not necessarily something I campaigned on, but um, in terms of the priorities of state agencies and work that needs to be done, it's very high on the list. And so um, the two executive orders I think you're referring to, the one establishing the prison oversight uh, task force, I think that's critical um, with a new incoming director having um, that um, support from the community to to really um, point to the kind of reforms that are needed and that he is is ready to help make in the system. And then the second one, um, establishing the the independent commissioner um, over the the just to review the death penalty process. And you know, this is pretty narrow in focus. It's not looking at the whole the whole issue of the death penalty and how we um, how we get there. But but if we are um, conducting executions, that there are processes in place. And this was brought about by, you know, the the execution several years ago that took a very long time. And um, there's not a lot of transparency about what happened there. And then um, there was a, a, a long pause. Um, and the, the former AG just recently um, started uh, issuing death warrants again. And so wanting to make sure that there is a process in place that ensures um, if we are conducting executions in the name of the taxpayers of Arizona that, that we're doing it um, the right way. And so you mentioned when it comes to state departments, you know, Department of Corrections is at the top. Can you give me some specifics as to why that is at the top for you? Well, if you look at the state budget, it is um, one of the largest uh, uh, expenses in our state budget. Um, and there's just been so much news about practices that um, that don't treat prisoners humanely, that are costing more um, dollars than they should. Um, healthcare and the lawsuit we're embroiled in is one example of that. But even just the idea of private prisons and the guaranteed occupancy rates in their contracts, which are not the most advantageous to the taxpayers of Arizona. Um, practices like the, the high cost of just inmates being able to communicate with their family members, um, which is such an important lifeline to keep them connected when they're released. Um, the inmate labor practices, which have been called into question, the practices of um, requiring pregnant prisoners to be induced into labor. Um, that's just really inhumane. Um, the lack of access to feminine hygiene products, which was recently um, highlighted. So there's just a broad array of things that um, we, we need to look at to ensure that we are treating prisoners in our care in a humane way and efficiently using taxpayer dollars in this really expensive system. You mentioned the lawsuit that the state's embroiled in, um, Jensen v. Shin. And so within that lawsuit, Judge Silver found that the state was violating, you know, constitutional rights and that the crux of it for some of the lack of mental and health care was due to staffing. You know, in the remedial order, Judge Silver says staffing needs to be upped. Yeah. Are you aware of lack of staffing within the prison, staffing shortages? Yeah, I mean, I think um, in particular, uh, as it relates to this lawsuit, one of the ways that our hands are really tied is that statute requires for health care in the state prisons to be provided by a contractor. We, we can't provide it directly. And, um, and so a lot of the problem is holding the contractors accountable. And I don't think that a lot has been done to do that. And so we need to step up there and make sure that, um, that these contractors are delivering the services that they're required to. And if the judge says it's not adequate, that we make sure that it is. And so if that means that we need to find ways to supplement um, this, the healthcare services with our own staffing, um, we're going to do whatever it takes. I think in large part, this is not a new lawsuit. Um, and this ruling comes at the end of 
or the court order comes at, after a long process of trying to fix this and it largely being ignore, ignored by the previous administration. Are there anywhere else, you know, aside from the lawsuit, mm -hmm. um, staffing shortages within prisons that you're aware of um, that, w whether it's corrections officers, medics, anything like that, are you aware of staffing shortages anywhere else? Well, I'm sure... Um, there, there's a there's an uh, staffing across the board um, in the correction system has been um, recruiting people is difficult. Um, workforce shortages are a problem everywhere, not just in corrections. And so, and this is I think something that um, the 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 task force, the oversight um, committee, will be able to look at. Are we at recommended levels of staffing in different areas um, and make sure that we have the resources to to get to where we need to be to keep both the inmates and the staff uh, safe. Within your executive order, specifically the one creating the Independent Oversight Commission, what within the first line, I think it says, you mentioned transparency within the first line, and then when you hit the second line, it says preventing misconduct. Mm -hmm. um, why did you choose to put the word misconduct in the executive order? Well, I think um, there's been recent reports, not necessarily um, on the state side, but in, at the county, there was a recent arrest of a, an officer who was um, trying to smuggle drugs into um, a county facility. Um, I, I don't think that's an isolated incident, and I think that when you have lower staffing levels um, than are maybe recommended or um, lack of oversight, that that makes things ripe for that kind of misconduct and really exploiting a population um, that there's not maybe a lot of sympathy for. And so we just want to make sure that we're not leaving the system open to that kind of, of activity. Are you aware of any misconduct like that we saw at the county level within the state level? Um, not specifically, but but I mean, I, I think the idea of, of drugs being smuggled into correctional facilities is not new, and and it and I'm not aware of anything specific, but um, um, it wouldn't surprise me to find something like that. Is there anything else that you learned, you know, after becoming governor, that really put prisons at the forefront for you? Uh, you've mentioned out of all the state agencies, you know, they were the top. Is there anything that maybe you learned once being sworn into the office that you may, wanted to prioritize this? No surprises for sure. Just the fact that uh, it, there has been so much widespread reporting about different issues and really not a lot of attention um, or, or attempts to, to try to correct those things. I kind of want to move into what you were talking about, not being surprised about maybe some of the misconduct we were talking about within the state prisons as to what was happening on the county level. So we at KTAR have actually had a source come to us within the corrections department and tell us that, you know, drugs are throughout the mm -hmm. state prisons here, overdoses are happening. We've actually been able to confirm through documents with the Department of Corrections that Narcan has been administered due to overdoses. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of overdoses going on in the jails and the use of Narcan in the prisons? Um, I have not been made aware of that, but I think this is why um, transparency is so important um, because it sounds like a lot of stuff has happened that maybe has been tried to, to be covered up. And I want to make sure that our administration, whether it's the Department of Corrections, Rehabilitation and Reentry, or any other department is operating in a way that is transparent and accountable to the public, the public taxpayers who pay their salaries um, and who's, who they're supposed to serve. And we're going to operate in that way. So I am glad that there's been, you know, public records requests that get this kind of information out there so that we can address these issues. What would you like to see change here? What is your overall goal for the Department of Corrections? I think the culture shift I just mentioned is going to be really critical. Um, and this is an agency that um, I, I think, in, in all honesty, that the previous administration just kind of wanted to not deal with and was happy to let the director um, you know, do whatever they wanted and not really address the root of these problems. And I think that um, it goes down. It goes down to not necessarily being focused on treating prisoners humanely um, and making sure that if you have this agency, just changing the name to the Department of Corrections uh, Rehabilitation and Reentry doesn't change the culture. And that we can't keep people locked up forever. We have to focus on how we re rehabilitate them and how we um, get them back into communities um, and, and reduce recidivism. Uh, or what are we doing? And that, that's going to take a big culture shift to do that. 
Make sure to stay tuned for continued coverage on this exclusive story. Our next installment will be another sit down interview, this time with the Arizona Department of Corrections Rehabilitation and Reentry Director, Dr. Ryan Thornell.